We are going to continue discussing the topic of chronic inflammation and uh, today in the frameworks of this topic I would like to talk about granulomatous uh, diseases which are now becoming more and more relevant. This is due to a number of aspects. Um, granulomatous diseases um, become more often diagnosed due to the advancement of modern um, medical science uh, due to the use of um, X-ray, computed tomography, MRI and puncture biopsy. Uh, there are difficulties in the process of making a diagnosis and uh, as a result incorrect diagnosis and incorrect treatment may follow. And for the discussion, um, I would like to have a look at diffuse granulomatous lung diseases. Diffuse granulomatous pulmonary diseases form a heterogeneous group of clinical and physiopathological entities. However, the formation of granulomas as a common histopathological feature constitutes an important diagnostic element since it orients the clinical reasoning towards a relatively limited group of etiologies. An accurate diagnosis is based on a correlation between clinical and radiological data and the specific histological, histochemical and microbiological characteristics of each disease. Molecular and immunohistochemical methods may be necessary. The path to the final histopathological diagnosis should be systematized considering both physiopathology and the differential morphological aspects of granulomatous diseases. The respir respiratory system is exposed to a variety of potentially harmful agents, many of which are environmental and aggress the organism by inhalation. There are several lines of defense against such agents covering from the upper airways to the alveolar spaces. The first line of defense of the respiratory system consists of mechanical factors such as hair and the coughing reflex, mucociliary transport and biochemical mucus components such as immunoglobulins, and complement. Although unspecific, these mechanisms prevent most of the external agents from reaching their alveolar space. Among the unspecific defense mechanisms of the alveolar space, there are the pulmonary surfactant and the alveolar macrophages. The alveolar macrophages can stimulate the rapid migration of neutrophils into the alveolar lumen as initial phagocytes. Once exposed to the antigen, the alveolar macrophage can activate the specific immune response through antigenic presentation. This response is characterized by cytokine-mediated clonal lymphocyte expansion, migration of lymphocytes, plasma cells, and monocytes into the interstitium and the alveolar space. Effector mechanisms mediated by specific immunoglobulins, affected T cells, and macrophage activation are also triggered. The granulomatous inflammatory process is one of the effector mechanisms of the immune response and the last line of pulmonary defense. This response pattern arises as a result of certain aggressive agents or antigens which could not be eliminated by the previously mentioned mechanisms. The formation of a granuloma is determined by an interaction between macrophages and T lymphocytes triggered by antigenic presentation and mediated by cytokines. 
The process culminates with the recruiting, proliferation and activation of both cell types besides fibroblast migration. Granuloma formation also occurs in a group of diseases in which the immune response plays a crucial role in the clinical and anatomical pathological manifestations, even though their etiological aspects remain poorly elucidated, such as, for example, sarcoidosis. The granulomatous pulmonary diseases are divided into two main groups, infectious and non-infectious. Infectious causes include tuberculosis, histoplasmosis, fungi in general, paracocodiomycosis, ascariadesis, echinococcosis, and dirofilariosis. Non-infection causes include histiosis X, hypersensitivity pneumonia, vasculitis, lymphomas, sarcoidosis, and pneumoconiosis such as silicosis and bereliosis. You will have a separate lecture on infection, infectious diseases and that is why we will focus on non-infection granulomatous pulmonary diseases in this section. Each non-infectious granulomatous pulmonary disease presents distinctive clinical and radiological characteristics, particularly in the classical form. However, these characteristics may present various degrees of overlapping, being even mistaken for possible infectious diseases. In this context, the histopathological test is of fundamental importance to confirm the granulomatose nature and to rule out a possible infectious cause. Moreover, the etiopathogenic differences are reflected by the histological presentation of each disease, allowing to differentiate them morphologically with a certain degree of accuracy. The histological characteristics evaluated are the histoanatomical distribution of granulomas and the presence of necrosis. Diseases with a bronchocentric or inhalation distribution like chronic hypersensitivity pneumonia or pneumonitis and histiocytosis X tend to affect the axial region of the pulmonary lobe, being characterized as an airway centered diseases. Chronic hypersensitivity pneumonia or pneumonitis is characterized by a chronic interstitial inflammatory process, usually secondary to prolonged exposure to inhaled organic dusts and occupational antigens. Chronic hypersensitivity pneumonia can present a distinctive histopathological pattern when all three characteristics are present. Interstitial cellular bronchiolocentric pneumonia, shown by yellow arrows, non caseating granulomas, shown by red arrow on the picture, and intraluminal fibrosis or organizing pneumonia. The formation of incomplete non-necrotizing granuloma occurs and can be accompanied by obliterating bronchiolitis in 50% of the cases and by obliterating bronchiolitis with organizing pneumonia in 25%. Pathology, pathological findings in hypersensitivity pneumonitis are often categorized into acute stage, subacute stage, and chronic stage. In acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, histopathology shows non-specific findings of acute lung injury, including P. 
peri bronchovascular fibrin deposition, interstitial accumulation of neutrophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages. And alveolar spaces may contain proteinicos, exudates, edema, or hemorrhage. On the picture, you see a lung biopsy from a patient with acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Lung biopsy shows a chronic inflammatory infiltrate composed mainly, mainly of lymphocytes in the interstitium. This is shown by the star and the alveoli, uh, shown by the yellow arrows. Several multinucleated giant cells, shown by black arrows are also present. The histologic changes of subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis occur at the level of terminal bronchioles and the alveoli and consist of a classic histological triad consisting of predominantly lymphotic interstitial infiltrate, cellular bronchiolitis and poorly formed non-necrotizing granulomas. The characteristic lymphotic infiltrate likely develops through the interplay of heightened recruitment through upregulation of alveolar macrophage co-stimulatory molecules, oligoclonal expansion of lymphocyte gene segments producing local proliferation, and increased longevity of the cells through alterations in numerous apoptotic pathways. On the picture, you see an area of bronchiolar metaplasia shown by the arrows and lymphoid aggregate shown by the stump. Rarely, well-formed granulomas may be seen. Lung biopsy in a patient with a sub acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis on the left picture shows non-necrotizing granuloma shown by the black arrow with multinucleated giant cells shown by the white arrow. On the picture on the right you see poorly formed granulomas shown by the yellow arrow. The classic poorly formed granulomas are most commonly seen in the peribronchiolar tissue. Giant cells are usually present in conjunction with granulomas and often contain cholesterol clefts within their cytoplasm. Histopathology in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis consistently shows Chronic bronchiolitis with varying degrees of patchy fibrosis, fibroblastic fossae. On the left picture you see a large area of fibrosis within which there are two fibroblastic fossae shown uh, by the black arrows, long black arrows on the picture on the left that contain bluish myxoid stroma. On the picture on your right, you see extensive interstitial fibrosis shown by the solid white arrow and honeycomb change shown by short black arrows in a patient with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Complete destruction of alveoli is also observed with only mucus-filled dilated air spaces lined by bronchial epithelial cells. There is also secondary pulmonary hypertension as demonstrated by the presence of the thick-walled pulmonary arterial branch shown by the um, black, dashed black arrow. Plural surface is indicated by red arrows. The chest radiograph is of limited utility in confirming a diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis and is 
felt to have greater clinical significance in ruling out other diagnoses in question. Up to 20% of patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis will have no abnormalities on the chest radiograph. When abnormalities are noted, the most common pattern of findings is nodular or reticular nodular ground glass nodules with sparing of the lung bases. Chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis often manifests as non-specific upper lung zone predominant fibrotic changes such as honeycombing and reticular opacities. Computed tomography is, prever- is preferred in the radiologic evaluation of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. In acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, computed tomography may be normal or may show diffuse ground glass or central lobular ground glass nodules. In subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, often features uh, lobular areas of decreased attenuation represented air trapping. On the left picture, CT showing fibrotic changes of hypersensitivity pneumonitis with superimposed finding of air trapping in this patient with known hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Air trapping may be seen in up to 75% of patients with this diagnosis. In chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, fibrotic changes such as septal thickening, traction bronchioctasis, and honeycombing are seen classically in a peribronchovascular distribution with a mid lung and upper lung zone predominance. Although lower and peripheral lung distribution also may be seen. Lung consolidation may be seen in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but is felt to represent superimposed infection and is not intrinsically related to hypersensitivity pneumonitis pathology. The differential diagnosis for fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis includes idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, and sarcoidosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a chronic fibrosing idiopathic interstitial lung disease that occurs more commonly in the six and seven decades of life, is common among smokers and shows male predominance, and um, environmental exposures including metal dusts, wood dust, avian antigens, and vegetable and animal dusts are associated with an increased risk of developing idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is characterized by radiologic and pathologic features known as the usual interstitial pneumonitis pattern. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is indistinguishable from hypersensitivity pneumonitis in terms of non-specific clinical presentation and pulmonary function testing, which shows restrictive pattern and decreased DLCO. The usual interstitial pneumonitis pattern on computer tomography is characterized by a basilar or peripheral distribution of reticular opacities with subplural fibrosis, traction bronchiectasis, and honeycombing. Up to 70% of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis will have mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Both usual interstitial pneumonitis shown on the picture and hypersensitivity pneumonitis may feature honeycombing, 
traction bronchiectasis, irregular reticulations on computer tomography. The presence of micronodules, a peribronchovascular distribution of findings, multilobal decreased attenuation, and sparing of the lung bases favor hypersensitivity pneumonitis over usual interstitial pneumonitis. Non-specific interstitial pneumonia is a chronic inflammatory infiltrative process which most commonly presents with cough and progressive dyspnea and occurs most commonly in non-smokers. Non-specific interstitial pneumonia shows a female predominance. Pulmonary function test in non-specific interstitial pneumonia show a restrictive pattern, like hypersensitivity pneumonitis, Non-specific interstitial pneumonia may show computer demography findings of patchy ground glass opacities with reticular opacities and honeycombing present to a highly variable extent. Unlike hypersensitivity pneumonitis, however, there is a lower lung zone predominance in non-specific interstitial pneumonia of up to 94%. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis may mimic usual interstitial pneumonitis and non-specific interstitial pneumonia on imaging. On the picture, you see a case of non-specific interstitial pneumonia that shows symmetric lower lung predominant reticular abnormality exuberant traction, bronchioctasis, and ground glass opacity, as well as a dilated esophagus in the patient with underlying collagen vascular disease. Sarcoidosis is a multi-system granulomatous disease which features a non-specific clinical presentation and a female predominance. Pulmonary function tests can show obstruction, restriction, or both. Computer tomography features common to both hypersensitivity pneumonitis and sarcoidosis include ground glass opacities, mosaic perfusion, and upper lobe predominant fibrosis. Architectural distortion with traction bronchiectasis and honeycombing are commonly observed with fibrotic progression of the disease. On the picture, computer tomography scan shows multiple micronodules with a peribronchovascular distribution in both lungs, predominantly in the upper and middle lobes. One cluster of nodules in the periphery of the left upper lobe shown by the arrow has coalesced to form a conglomerate lesion. The presence of well-formed non-necrotic granulomas on a pathology strongly favors sarcoidosis over hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The management of hypersensitivity pneumonitis depends on early identification of the disease process, which is complicated by its non-specific clinical presentation in addition to variable and diverse laboratory and radiologic findings. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is the result of exposure and sensitization to myriad aerosolized antigens hypersensitivity pneumonitis develops in the minority of antigenic exposures and conversely has been documented in patients with no identifiable exposure, complicating the diagnostic algorithm significantly. Physicians must have a high degree of clinical suspicion. Alas, Many cases of hypersensitivity pneumonitis go misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. Key imaging findings, including a constellation of changes 
seen on computer tomography, known as the head cheese sign, can contribute greatly to the diagnostic challenge. But a multidisciplinary approach is essential in this endeavor. Prompt diagnosis and early intervention are critical in slowing the progression of irreversible parenchymal damage and additionally in preserving the quality of life of affected patients. Sarcoidosis is a multi-system disorder that is characterized by non casus epithelioid cell granulomas, which may affect almost any organ. Involvement of the lung and the mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes is most common, being seen in approximately 90% of patients and accounts for most of the morbidity and mortality associated with this condition. The incidence of sarcoidosis varies widely through the world, probably because of differences in environmental exposure, surveillance methods and predisposing genetic factors. Demographic factors, including race, ethnicity, age and sex, markedly affect local incidence. There is also scientific evidence of familial clustering of sarcoidosis. Although sarcoidosis can affect patients of any age, sex or race, it typically affects adults less than 40 years old and the incidence peaks in the third decade of their life. Estimates of the prevalence of sarcoidosis range from less than one case to 40 cases per 100,000 people in general population. In the United States, the age-adjusted annual incidence among blacks is more than triple than among whites. Sarcoidosis is rarely reported in India, Saudi Arabia, Spain, Portugal and South America, perhaps partly because of the absence of mass screening programs and partly because granulomatous pulmonary disease is attributed to other, more common causes, such as tuberculosis, leprosy and fungal infections. The manifestations and natural history of sarcoidosis are also influenced by epidemiologic factors. Whites often present without symptoms, whereas blacks often present with severe multi-system disease. Higher mortality rates have this data, may be somewhat biased because of differences in access to healthcare. The most common clinical features at presentation are respiratory symptoms including cough, dyspnea, bronchial hyperactivity, as well as fatigue, night sweats, weight loss, and erythema nodosum. However, as many as 50% of cases of sarcoidosis are asymptomatic, with abnormalities detected incidentally at chest radiography. Pulmonary function Tests typically demonstrate a restrictive ventilatory defect with decreased volumes and decreased carbon monoxide diffusing capacity. Factors associated with a poor prognosis include stage 2 or 3 pulmonary disease at the time of initial diagnosis, disease onset after the age of 40 years, black race, hypercalcemia, splenomegaly, osseous involvement, chronic uveitis, and lupus pernium. Common early-stage features that are associated with a good prognosis with a spontaneous remission rate of more than 85% include fever, polyarthritis, erythema nodosum, and bilateral HeLa lymph node enlargement. Sarcoidosis is an immune-mediated multi-system disease. The most widely accepted explanation of the pathogenesis of sarcoidosis is that one or more specific environmental agents 
trigger an inflammatory response in the immune system of a genetically susceptible host. However, the supposed antigenic agents responsible for the disease have yet to be identified. Epithelioid cell granulomas are a result of stimulation of cell-mediated immunity. Activated alveolar macrophages and T cells release interleukin-1, fibronectin, and alveolar macrophage-derived growth factor, which in turn activate and recruit additional T cell and fibroblasts. The population of activated T cells releases other factors, including interleukin-2, monocyte chemotactic factor and immune interferon that stimulate and recruit additional immune cells. The process may resolve spontaneously or it may progress to the extensive formation of non caseous granulomas that is characteristic histologic feature of sarcoidosis along as progression uh, to fibrosis. The histologic hallmark of sarcoidosis is non caseous granulomas composed of a central core of histocytes, epithelioid cells, and multinucleated giant cells surrounded by lymphocytes, scattered plasma cells, and varying quantities of fibroblasts and collagen in the periphery. The genin cells may contain cytoplasmic inclusions such as asteroid bodies and Schumann bodies. The central portion of the granuloma consists predominantly of lymphocytes and express CD4 protein, whereas lymphocytes that express CD8 are found in the peripheral zone. Dense bands of fibroblasts mast cells, collagen, and proteoglycans may encase the granuloma and lead to fibrosis and organ damage and irreversible disruption of organ function. Fibriotic changes usually begin at the periphery of a granuloma and extend centrally, leading to complete fibrosis, hellenization, or both. Granulomas occasionally exhibit focal coagulative, coagulative necrosis and it has been suggested that necrotizing sarcoid granulomatosis may be a variant of sarcoidosis. Granulomas in the lung parenchyma have a characteristic distribution in a relation to lymphatics in the peribronchovascular interstitial space, subplural interstitial space and to a lesser extent in the interlobular septum, including a lymphangiotic distribution. The upper lobes of the lungs are most severely affected. Vascular involvement is observed in more than half of patients with sarcoidosis who undergo an open lung biopsy or autopsy study. More than 40 years ago, Slitzbach developed a sarcoidosis staging system based on the pattern of chest radiographic findings, a system still widely used because of its great prognostic value. The Slitzbach classification system defines the following five stages of sarcoidosis. Stage zero, with a normal appearance at a chest radiography. Stage one, with lymphadenopathy only. Stage 2, with lymphadenopathy and parenchymal lung disease. Stage 3, with parenchymal lung disease only. And stage 4, with pulmonary fibrosis. Approximately 5 to 10% of patients have stage 0 disease. 50% stage 1. 25 to 30 is stage 2, and 10 to 12 is stage 3. Although in most patients the condition 
either regresses or remains stable, it progresses to pulmonary fibrosis in approximately one-fourth of patients. Generally, pulmonary function worsens with more advanced disease stages. Spontaneous remission occurs in 60-90% of patients with stage 1 disease. In 40 to 70% with stage 2 disease, in 10 to 20% with stage 3 disease, and remission, spontaneous remission occurs in 0% with stage 4 disease. A di diagnosis of sarcoidosis is established on the basis of compatible clinical and radiologic findings and histologic evidence of the presence of non-caseous epithelioid cell granulomas in one or more organs and the absence of causative organisms or particulates. Granulomas of known causes and local sarcoid-like reactions must be excluded. Granulomatous lesions may result from many conditions, including tuberculosis, berylliosis, leprosy, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, Crohn disease, primary biliary cirrhosis, and fungal disease. Moreover, local sarcoid-like reactions may be seen in lymph nodes that drain a neoplasm or a site of chronic inflammation. Such reactions also have been seen in patients who have undergone chemotherapy and radiation therapy. If biopsy of lymph nodes or pulmonary or pleural tissue is necessary for diagnosis, one of three techniques may be used. Transbronchial biopsy, city-guided biopsy, or surgical biopsy. The use of surgical technique may be warranted when the results of biopsy with another procedure are not definitive and biopsy of mediastinal lymph, no lymph nodes, lung or both, is required. This can generally be done with minimally invasive procedures such as cervical media mediastinoscopy and a peristernal mini-thoractomy for biopsy of the outer pulmonary window or para-aortic nodes or video-assisted thoracoscopic surgical biopsy. The development of endobronchial ultrasonography is one of the most important recent advances in bronchial imaging. Endobronchial ultrasonography combined with fine needle aspiration biopsy is a minimally invasive technique that is now routinely used in many pulmonary centers where it may replace more invasive methods such as mediastinoscopy for evaluating enlarged mediastinal or hilar lymph nodes because it helps improve the diagnostic yield. Its clinical application and diagnostic benefit have been established in studies in which it was compared with conventional radiologic methods and other diagnostic procedures. When the presence of pulmonary sarcoidosis is suspected, diagnostic procedures should ideally allow histologic verification, assessment of the extent and severity of organ involvement, assessment of whether disease is stable or likely to progress, and determination of whether a patient might benefit from treatment. Open lung biopsies are rarely performed in patients with sarcoidosis. However, Nishimura with Scoffer's correlated histopathologic findings with computer tomography features in eight patients with sarcoidosis in whom open lung biopsies have been performed. Excuse me. Thickened bronchovascular bundles and small perivascular nodules seen at computed tomography corresponded to granulomas within the connective tissues, heath, 
surrounding pulmonary airways and vessels. Pleural or subpleural nodules were correlated with granulomas adjacent to the visceral pleura. Ground glass opacities represented an accumulation of many granulomatous lesions with or without fibrosis in the alveolar septa and around, around the small vessels. No alveolitis was seen. Large parenchymal nodules, more than one centimeter in diameter, represented coalescent granulomas. Air bronchiolograms within regions of dense consolidations on computer tomography images corresponded to bronchiolar dilation with surrounding fibrosis and a honeycomb-like pattern of microscopic cysts seen at pathologic analysis. In a series of 60 patients with sarcoidosis, computer tomography findings of airway abnormalities like bronchial wall thickening or bronchial luminal narrowing or stenosis were correlated with bronchial granulomas in biopsy specimens. On the left picture, computed tomography scan shows typical bilateral and symmetric hilar shown by the arrow and subcarinal shown by the star lymphadenopathy and histological confirmation on, on the right picture. Micronodular lesions is the most common parenchymal disease pattern seen in patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis, which is shown in 75 to 90% of cases. Computer tomography shows sharply defined, small, of 2 to 4 millimeters in diameter, rounded nodules, usually with a bilateral and symmetric distribution, predominantly but not invariably in the upper and middle zones. The nodules are found most often in the subpleural peribronchovascular interstitium, although sarcoid granulomas arise as micronodular lesions, they may coalesce over time, forming larger lesions, macronodules. On the left picture, computer tomography scan of the right lung in a woman with pulmonary sarcoidosis shows the typical paralymphatic distribution of micronodules shown by the white arrow. On the right picture, a lung biopsy specimen demonstrates numerous epithelioid granulomas shown by the arrow surrounding the bronchial walls and immediately beneath the normal bronchial epithelium shown by the arrowheads. In most patients, sarcoid granulomas resolve with time. In an estimated 20% of patients, fibrosis becomes more prominent over time, producing CT and radiographic findings of linear opacities, traction bronchioctasis, and architectural distortion, displacement of fissures and bronchovascular bundles. Fibrosis is seen predominantly in the upper and middle zones. On the left, you see an alveolar sarcoid pattern of airspace consolidation in pulmonary sarcoidosis. CT scan shows alveolar consolidation in the left upper lobe and patchy subpleural alveolar opacities in the right upper no lobe. Architectural distortion and traction bronchiectasis, signs of fibrosis also are viable, mainly in the right upper lobe. On the right picture you see a fibrosis shown by the red arrow along with the bronch bronchovascular bundles. Confluent Nodular opacities that appear on CT images as bilateral areas of lung consolidation 
with irregular edges and blurred margins radiating from the helium toward the periphery are often seen with or without air bronchograms. These areas of consolidation are less homogeneous peripherally and are usually accompanied by micronodules. On the left picture, a CD scan shows multiple micronodules with a peribronchovascular distribution in both lungs, predominantly in the upper and middle lobes. One cluster of nodules in the periphery of the left upper lobe, shown by the arrow, has coalesced to form a conglomerate lesion, known also as a macronodule. On the picture on the right, a lower part of the right upper lobe shows multiple confluent granulomas infiltrating the peribronchovascular, shown by the arrows, and subplural interstitium, shown by the arrowheads. A solitary lung mass or nodule is rarely seen in sarcoidosis. However, individual granulomas that coalesce may produce the appearance of solitary mass-like opacities. In some clinical contexts, multiple well-defined rounded macronodules, the nodules with diameters exceeding 5 mm, might mimic a metastatic process. On the left picture, a CT scan shows a pulmonary nodule shown by the arrow in a subplural region. On the middle picture, a subplural nodule that is darker in color because of anthrax causes. And on the right picture, you can see multiple non-necrotic granulomas shown by the yellow arrows, expanding the interstitium that surrounds the subplural nodule. I want to show several cases of sarcoidosis to understand how morphological findings correlate with the CD features. You see a CD scan that shows mediastinal lymph node enlargement and a reticular pattern produced by nodularity and thickening of intralobular septa, pleural surfaces and fissures. Uh, on the other picture, there is a specimen from fine needle aspiration biopsy of an enlarged right paratracheal lymph node that shows a group of histiocytes against a lymphotic Lymphocytic background, a cytologic structure characteristic of sarcoid granuloma. On the last picture, there is a lung biopsy specimen from another patient that shows progressive thickening of the interlobular septum because of the accumulation of numerous sarcoid granulomas shown by the arrowheads. On the picture on the left, a CT scan obtained in a patient with pulmonary sarcoidosis shows a mosaic pattern consisting of multiple areas of low attenuation shown by the arrows. Inter interpierced with larger areas of normal lung parenchyma. On the picture on the right, a transbronchial lung biopsy specimen shows the accumulation of sarcoid granulomas shown by the star in the mucosal and some submucosal layers of bronchiolar epithelium shown by the black stars, black arrows, excuse me. On the left picture, CT scan obtained at the subcarinal level in a patient with pulmonary sarcoidosis shows chronic pleural effusions, diffuse pleural thickening shown by the arrows and the hilar and mediastinal lymphadenopathy. On the right picture, a forest 
thoracoscopic lung biopsy specimen shows conglomerations of sarcoid granulomas underlying and protruding outward from the pleural surface, shown by black arrows. Um, the black stars show underlying, while white stars show um, sarcoid granulomas protruding outwards. Thoracic, thoracic sarcoidosis has been called the great mimic. It manifests with various patterns at radiologic imaging, necessitating an initially broad differential diagnosis that includes lymphoma, tuberculosis, and many other causes of chronic pulmonary infiltrates. Severe thoracic sarcoidosis causes significant clinical and functional impairment and is associated with high morbidity and mortality. Histiocytosis X, also known as Langerhans cell histiocytosis, encompasses a group of disorders of unknown origin with widely diverse clinical presentations and outcomes characterized by infiltration of the involved tissues by large numbers of Langerhans cells often organized into granulomas. The classification of histiocytosis X clinical patterns developed by the Histiocyte Society is based chiefly on the number of organs involved. Acute disseminated histiocytosis X, lateral zivus disease, is a severe multisystemic disease that predominantly affects young children and less commonly older adults and carries a poor prognosis. Multifocal histiocytosis X is seen mainly in older children and adolescents and is known as Hunt-Schuller-Christian syndrome or multifocal eosinophilic granuloma. It runs a variable but usually more favorable course. Single system disease, eosinophilic granuloma and primary pulmonary histiocytosis is characterized by the involvement of a single organ, bone, lungs or skin and usually be, follows a benign course and can regress spontaneously. Pulmonary involvement of patients with multisystemic disease is rarely at the forefront of the clinical picture, yet may be of the adverse prognostic significance. Isolated or predominant pulmonary involvement is the pattern encountered by a pulmonologist in adults and has a number of specific epidemiological and clinical features that warrant its individualization as a separate entity. Pulmonary histiocytosis X in adults is an uncommon disorder that occurs almost exclusively in smokers and for which accurate epidemiological data are not available. The wide Use of chest high-resolution computed tomography, HRCT, is in the evaluation of patients may lead to an increase in the number of patients in whom histiocytosis X is diagnosed. Pulmonary histiocytosis X predominantly affects young adults with a frequency peak at 20 to 40 years of age. Female patients may be slightly older particularly in the USA. A marked male predominance was initially reported, but in more recent studies, a similar proportion of males and females, or even slight predominance of females, was observed, particularly in series from the United States. These differences probably reflect smoking habits and their changes over time. Indeed, the most striking epidemiological characteristic of adult pulmonary histiocytosis X is that 90 to 100 of percent of patients are smokers, often smoking more than 20 cigarettes per day. No other epidemiological factors associated with pulmonary histiocytosis have been identified. K 
Cases of pulmonary histiocytosis X have been reported after radiation therapy and or chemotherapy for lymphoma, most notably Hodgkin's disease. Since the etiology of histiocytosis X is unknown, but the pathogenesis of the disease remains poorly understood. In addition, no animal model is available for this disease. And although the various clinical patterns of histiocytosis X share similar histopathological features, it is unclear whether similar mechanisms apply to all forms of histiocytosis X. The tremendous progress achieved recently in knowledge concerning the biology of dendritic cells, however, has given important input into the understanding of the mechanisms potentially involved in histiocytosis X. In pulmonary histiocytosis X, pathogenic hypothesis must take into account at least three aspects. The selective involvement of bronchioles by the histiocytosis X lesions and the initial accumulation of Langerhans cells at this site. The ability of Langerhans cells granulomas to destroy the bronchioles that they infiltrate and the very strong epi epidemiological link with smoking as well as the low incidence of pulmonary histiocytosis X compared with the prevalence of smoking in the general population. It should be highlighted that a similar mechanism can be involved at these different steps, leading, for example, both focal Langerhans cell accumulation and the destructive effects of Langerhans cell, uh, cells on the bronchioli wall. In contrast to dendritic cells that are present in most tissues like lymphoid organs, dermis, pulmonary parenchyma and others, Langerhans cells are localized specifically in the epidermis and other mucosal epithelia, including the epithelium of the airways, shown on the picture on the right. Uh, these cells differ morphologically from other dendritic cells by the presence in their cytoplasm of specific organelles, Birbeck granules, visible only by electron microscopy and involved in internaliz internalization of exogenous substances. Langerhans cells can also be identified by the expression of the specific marker Langerin, a type 2 monoslectin that is constitutively associated with Berbeck granules on the, shown by um, on the left picture by a white arrow. Besides the circulating precursors of Langerhans cells, it was recently shown that dermally resident CT CD14 positive cells can differentiate into Langerhans cells. In the normal one, Langerhans cells are virtually confined to the tracheobronchial epithelium where they form a well-developed network. Although Langerhans cells are extremely sparse in the normal alveolar epithelium, these cells are present in the alveoli of smokers and patients with pulmonary inflammation in areas of alveolar epithelial hyperplasia. In addition, abundant Langerhans cells infiltrates may be found in lung cancer. Interestingly, the presence of Langerhans cells in these different pathological situations was closely correlated with local granular site macrophage colony stimulating factor production by hyperpla hyperplastic alveolar cells or bronchial tumor cells, strongly suggesting that granular site macrophage colony stimulating factor plays a key role in controlling the recruitment and or differentiation of Langerhans cells in the human lung. Pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis 
is pleomorphic in its presentation. Despite diffuse lung involvement, symptoms can be relatively minor or absent, and patients often initially attribute their symptoms to smoking. The interval between the onset of clinical symptoms and diagnosis is highly variable, but on average is around six months. The diagnosis is usually made in one of the following cases during the routine chest radiograph in almost every fourth case the disease causes no symptoms respiratory symptoms mainly a dry cough and somewhat less frequently dyspnea or exertion on exertion they are present in approximately two-thirds of cases and can be associated with constitutional manifestations like asthenia fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Spontaneous pneumothorax responsible for chest pain leads to the diagnosis in 10 to 20% of cases. The occurrence of pneumothorax seems more common in young males, may occur at any time, time during the course of the disease, and may be bilateral and or recurring, raising difficult therapeutic challenges. Pneumothorax should also be excluded in any patient complaining of increased dyspnea. Other infrequent presentations include um, chest pain resulting from an associated rib lesion or wheezing. A standard chest radiograph performed as a routine investigation leads to the diagnosis of adult pulmonary Langerhans cell histocytosis. Reticular micronodular infiltration is the commonest pattern. Cysts may be visible within the infiltrates, which symmetrically involve both lungs, predominating in the middle and upper lung fields and sparing the costophrenic angles. The infiltrates are often extensive, contrasting with the mildness of the respiratory symptoms. In contrast with most other diffuse pulmonary infiltrating diseases, lung volumes are normal or increased. Pneumothorax or more rarely a lytic lesion in a rib may be visible, providing valuable diagnostic orientation. Plural, fluid pleural effusion is not a feature, and medi mediastinal adenopathy is unusual. Although hilar enlargement may occur in patients with pulmonary hypertension, in advanced disease, nodular lesions are sparse or absent. In cysts, constitute the main radiographic abnormality, sometimes producing an emphysema like appearance. Finally, in very rare cases, the chest radiograph may be normal. Computed tomography provides additional details about the parenchymal element, elementary lesions, such as cavitation of nodules, which is not readily visible on standard radiographs. Similarly, the reticulation seen on standard radiographs is usually produced by contiguous small pulmonary cysts. The computer tomography permits the demonstration of parenchymal abnormalities in the rare patients whose chest radiographs are interpreted as normal. The typical computer tomography pattern combines small, poorly limited nodules, cavities, cavitated nodules and thick and thin walled cysts shown on the picture. These changes affect both the peripheral and the central parts of the lung fields. The lesions are focal, being separated by parenchyma that appears normal, usually predominate in the upper and middle lung fields and tend to spare the basal portions of the lungs. The distribution of the nodules is central lobula, reflecting the bronchial-centered development of pulmonary Langerhans cell histocytosis lesions. As the disease evolves, 
cystic lesions become a predominant finding shown on the picture. They vary in size, although most are less than one centimeter in diameter and may be isolated or confluent, sometimes mimicking central lobular emphysema. Longitudinal studies involving uh, serial computer tomography scans have shown that radiologic lesions progress over time from nodules to cavitated nodules, then thick walled cysts and finally thin walled cysts. They have also shown that nodules and cavitated nodules can resolve, whereas cysts usually persist on enlarge or enlarge over time. Other findings in pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis may include ground glass attenuation and linear densities or emphysematous bullets secondary to cigarette smoke exposure. Finally, computer tomography is crucial for selecting surgical biopsy sites in those patients who require this investigation. Accumulation of activated Langerhans cells organized into loose granulomas that develop in and destroy the distal bronchioli walls is the pathological hallmark of pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis lesions. Lymphocytes shown by the yellow arrow and inflammatory cells, including eosinophils shown by the red arrows, and macrophages shown by the black arrows are seen on this picture. In most respects, the, morpholo the mor morphology of Langerhans cells in Langerhans cell histiocytosis is similar to that found in normal tissue that um, you can also observe. Viewed viewed using light microscopy, Langerhans cells are moderately sized cells. They have a convoluted irregular nucleus and a pale weakly eosinophilic cytoplasm that contains few, if any, phagocytic particles shown on the left picture. Cell type confirmation must be obtained by immunohistochemical staining with monoclonal antibodies directed against the membrane antigen CD1A, shown on the middle picture, or by electron microscopic visualization of Birbeck granules, shown on the picture on the right, which are more numerous than in normal Langerhans cells. The nature of Langerhans cells present in the lesion can also be confirmed with an antibody against Langerine, a lectin specifically expressed by Langerhans cells, including those in Langerhans cells histiocytosis lesions. Positive staining uh, for the intracellular S100 protein although widely used in the past to identify Langerhans cells, is not specific to the cells and can also be observed in other cell types, such as neuroendocrine cells and some macrophages. The appearance of Langerhans cell histocytosis lesions varies with the stage of the disease and the tissue involved. In the lung, the lesions are focal, poorly demarcated, separated by apparently normal lung parenchyma, and centered on the terminal and respiratory bronchioles, destroying the airway walls. In view of this feature, pulmonary Langerhans cell histocytosis resembles bronchiolitis rather than a diffuse infiltrating lung disease. The granulomas are poorly demarcated. However, and extend into adjacent of and extend into adjacent alveolar structures. In addition, these alveoli often contain an abundance of pigmented macrophages, producing respiratory bronchitis, interstitial lung disease-like changes, or a discomative interstitial pneumonia-like pattern. 
in uninvolved areas, the lung architecture seems normal, despite the common presence of non-specific smoking-related abnormalities, respiratory bronchiolitis, intraalveolar accumulation of pigmented macrophages and lymphoid clusters infiltrating the alveolar walls. The pathological features change over time and lesions of various ages are often found in the same lung biopsy specimen. Early lesions are responsible for eccentric infiltration of the walls of terminal and respiratory bronchioles, which undergo gradual destruction shown on the picture. Owing to the close anatomical association with bronchioles, spread to adjacent arterioles is common, although the disease is not primarily a vasculitis. Rangerhans cells are abundant at this stage and form a compact central granuloma with a large number of lymphocytes located between the Langerhans cells and at the periphery of the lesion. Inflammatory cells, mainly eosinophils and macrophages, are also present in variable numbers. Destruction of the bronchiolar epithelium occurs early in the disease process, such that the bronchiole-centered development of the lesions may be difficult to confirm on a single section. Three-dimensional reconstruction of the lesions from serial section shows a granulomatose cuff spreading along the walls of the distal airways. Although early lesions often seem cavitated on the picture, the cavity is the residual lumen of the bronchiole destroyed by the granuloma's reaction and does not result from tissue necrosis. Later in the process, the Langerhans cells are less abundant and form clusters surrounded by lymphocytes and inflammatory cells, including eosinophils, macrophages, and a smaller number of neutrophils. Lymphoid nests, shown by an arrow, are often seen peripherally at the interface with an incipient fibrous reaction. Finally, in advanced disease, there are few or no longer found cells and macrophages containing pigment or lipid inclusions are found. The lesions are replaced by stellar fibrotic scars or by confluent and ingestant cystic cavities surrounded by a fibrous ring, which when conflu confluent can give a honeycomb aspect. Traction emphysema contributes to the cystic appearance of advanced lesions. The de de definite diagnosis of Langerhans cell histocytosis rests on the identification of the Langerhans cell granuloma in a tissue involved by the disease. Although transbronchial biopsy may show Langerhans cell granulomas in patients with pulmonary Langerhans cell histocytosis, histological documentation is more often obtained by surgical biopsy. The biopsy specimens should be taken from sites at which computed tomography shows an abundance of nodules. Since the lesions are local, precautions should be taken to increase, increase the diagnostic yield. The specimens should be sufficiently large to ensure the availability of adequate material. An extensive search for specific lesions should be performed. And whenever possible, a tissue fragment should be frozen for immunohistochemical studies aimed at identifying Langerhans cells. When no frozen tissue is available, the specimens can be tasted with the anti-CD1A O10 antibody, which reacts with Langerhans cells in Langerhans cells granulomas fixed in formalin and embedded in paraffin. Features of disquamative interstitial pneumonia may mask the Langerhans cells histocytosis lesions, and the presence of these findings should not discourage a meticulous search for pathological changes 
specific to Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Natural history of the disease is widely variable and unpredictable in the individual patient. Approximately 10 to 20 percent of patients have early severe manifestations consisting of recurrent pneumothorax or progressive respiratory failure with chronic corpulmonalum. Finally, 30 to 40 percent of patients show persistent symptoms of variable severity with conversion of radiological nodules into thick walled and then thin walled cysts that remain stable over time. Despite the apparent quiescence of the disease in the patients with persistent stable cysts, Langerhans cell granulomas may be present in the pulmonary parenchyma. Therefore, long-term follow-up is mandatory and may detect exacerbation of respiratory dysfunction after many years, rarely a relapse with recurrent nodule formation. Factors reported to predict adverse outcomes include onset of pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis at an old age, prolonged constitutional symptoms, recurrent pneumothorax, extrathoracic lesions uh, except for bone involvement, which has no bearing on the prognosis, diffuse cysts on imaging studies, and severe pulmonary function abnormalities on diagnosis, particular abnormalities in the first expiratory volume in one second. None of these criteria is failure-proof for predicting outcome in individual patients. Severe pulmonary hypertension indicates a poor prognosis. Pregnancy does not seem to influence the course of pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis in most patients. Exacerbation of Langerhans cell histiocytosis-related diabetes insipidus has been reported during pregnancy. Therefore, unless there is a severe respiratory failure, Langerhans cell histiocytosis is not a contraindication to pregnancy. In addition to an association between Langerhans cell histiocytosis and lymphoma, a high rate of primary lung cancers have been reported in patients with pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, with continued smoking being a risk factor. Various other malignancies have also been found to occur at increased rates. On the picture, you see different morphological manifestations um, of Langer Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Bronchiocentric collection of peculiar macrophages with prominent grooves accompanied by smokers macrophages and eosinophils uh, on picture 1a. Uh, uh, cellular bronchiolar nodules with irregular stellate shaped, uh, stellate shaped margins on picture b. On picture c, Langerhans cell histocytes express CD1A at immunohistochemistry. On picture D, um, you see disease progression and the nodules that tend to form central cavitation surrounded by fibro fibrosis and degrees of Langerhans cells. And on the last picture, the disease generally has a good prognosis, leaving hypercellular bronchiolar bronchiolar centric scars of dense fibrosis without Langerhans cells. This would conclude today's lecture and will continue our discussion during next week.